Thank you. Next up, I look for a motion to approve the agenda. Oh, sorry, roll call. I figured you're all here. <laughs> we are. We are all here. Is everybody here? If you're not here, say it. Trying to be efficient. Are you ready? Yeah, ready. Eva Henry, Steve Odoricio, Jeff Baker. Here. Peace Jones. Here. David Beacom. Here. Randy Wheelock. Here. Nicholas Williams. Here. Kevin Flynn. Here. Roger Partridge. Here. Nangles. <coughs> Bizebo. Bob Pfeiffer. Here. Bob Roth. Allison Hiltz. Larry Vidham. Here. David Spellman. Ben Brockett. Sam Weaver. Margo Ramsden. Ben Baca, Matt Johnston, Roger Hudson, Ben Price, George Teal, Tommy Maurer, Here. Jeremy Fay, Katie Brown, Russell Stewart, Richard Champ, Bill Christie, Here. Jackie Thomas, Catherine Whitman, Sarah Swanson, Here. Linda Olson, Here. Bill Gipp, Present. Daniel Dick, Peterson, Bobby Sindelar, Lisa Jones, Laura Brown, Here. Lynette Kelsey, Here. Scott Norquist, Storm Glore, Jim Dale, Here. Ron Rakowski, George Lance, Mike Hillman, Stephanie Walton, Here. Dana Gutwine, Jacob LeBure, Isaac Levy, Karina Elrod, Barry Strzok, Ann Shaw, John Peck, Ashley Stolzman. Here. Honey Sullivan. Here. Joyce Palazuski. Paul Sutton. Sean Foray. Chris Larson. Julie Mullica. John Dyack. Here. Sally Daigle. Dave Black. Sandy Hammerly. Clint Folsom. Jessica Sandgren. Herb Atchison. John Volz. Here. Ed Starker. Here. Adam Zarin. Rebecca White. Bill Van Meter. Here. We have a quorum. I'll also look for a motion for approval of the agenda. So moved. Second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Carries. <coughs> now we're going to be moving into item number five, the public hearing on the 2020-2023 Transportation Improvement Program. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Bob Pfeiffer, the chair of the Denver Regional Council of Governments. I thank you all for coming tonight. This evening, Dr. Cog is holding a public hearing on the draft 2020-2023 Transportation Improvement Tip, or excuse me, <coughs> Program or TIP, and the Companion Air Quality Conformity Determination Documents. This public hearing is hereby convened. The purpose of this hearing is to provide an opportunity for those who are interested in the draft 2020-2023 TIP to provide comments to the board. No decisions will be made and no actions will be taken tonight related to the public hearing. Receiving public comment is important to the board's decision making process. Anyone wishing to speak should have either registered on the sign-in sheet or have been previously made a request to speak through the Dr. Cog website or by phone. All comments via email, website, the interactive tip map, or in writing are automatically included in the public hearing record. Any comments received prior to this meeting have been provided to the board. If you wish to submit uh, write, written testimony to be included in the official record of this hearing, please give it to the secretary after you speak. Uh, board members are free to ask questions of those testifying. Um, Dr. Kurchell of Dr. Cog uh, staff will now summarize uh, the draft 2020-2023. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and good evening, everyone. So this public hearing is subject to three documents, um, the first being the 2023 Transportation Improvement Program, or TIP, and then two air quality um, conformity <laughs> determination documents. The Dr. Cog planning process structure um, all begins with the Dr. Cog Metro Vision Plan. So if you want to look at this like the umbrella plan that governs all the plans underneath. Um, the, the Metro Vision Plan is the shared vision for the future. Now the shared um, transportation vision for the future is um, under the document of Metro Vision Regional Transportation Plan. 
Of course, we can't afford everything that we wish for, but the, um, the fiscally constrained regional transportation plan contains a 20-year um, affordable transportation system. Basically, what can we afford at this time for the next 20 years? And then, of course, kind of an uh, of an outshoot of that is the transportation improvement program. So the four years of what we actually can afford. So what is the TIP? Uh, the TIP of the transportation improvement program is a short term planning program identifying the real transportation projects, all fiscally constrained of the federal and state resources that are available to us. This document is federally required and it addresses all, all of the FAST Act or the current federal transportation um, legislation requirements. Um, federal law requires that the, the TIP is updated at least every four years, though Dr. Cog does update this document and program every two years, however, conducting the call for projects every four. Uh, so this TIP is not just for Dr. Cog, but also contains projects selected by our planning partners, including CDOT and RTD. And of course, the TIP help, help, help implements that umbrella structure, as I mentioned earlier, MetroVision and the Regional Transportation Plan. <laughs> so this map um, shows a map of the Dr. Cog boundary, though the MPO does not encompass that entire boundary. The MPO, or what is um, where projects are eligible for the TIP, are contained within the blue boundary. So, now we can start talking about the Dr. Cog tip selection process, again, outside of the RTD in the CDOT process. So every four years um, after a call for projects is conducted, Dr. Cog conducts a post-tip analysis, simply asking both technical and policy folks what went well, what didn't go so well, what can we improve on for the next cycle? Um, so the process that was completed at the end of the 2016-21 tip um, we were in, staff was informed to uh, form some work groups which would review and recommend any adjustments that would be necessary. Part of those recommendation um, well, I, through the work group was to um, initiate two white papers. And one of those white papers suggested the use of what we're calling the dual model process. Now in the past and almost where every, uh, every MPL throughout the country conducts um, what we would call more of a centralized call for projects. This is simply where the MPO issues that call, applications come back, they are scored, and ultimately are selected by the MPO body. The dual model process takes that one step further. While there is that centralized process, we also are introducing kind of a decentralized process for um, what we're calling subregions. What we're calling the regional share or that centralized process, these are for projects that are transformative and where the benefits can be, can, uh, be shown throughout the entire region. We've also introduced what we call subregions, and a subregion is simply a, a county boundary with all the munici municipalities contained within. So all the applications kind of ran through the subregional process, or the regional shares ran through the subregions and ultimately were evaluated by a peer review panel and then ultimately the Dr. Cog board. For the sub-regional share, uh, the remaining funds, which were 80%, were proportionally targeted um, out to these predefined areas, which again, we're calling the sub-regions. Each of these sub-regions, uh, um, applicants within these sub-regions submitted, evaluated, selected, and ultimately recommended back to the Dr. Cog board the projects that they would like to fund. And of course, how we have had a tip set up for many cycles, uh, we also have set aside programs, and these are essentially off the top programs, um, which each having their own individual calls for projects. So how much funding is available? Uh, Dr. Cog allocates four funding sources. Um, the first being the Surface Transportation Block Grant Program, or STB, STBG. Um, for those who have been around a while, this is formerly uh, known as SDP Metro. Uh, this is our most flexible funding source uh, where we can include roadways, bridges, bicycle and pedestrian infrastructure, transit, uh, almost anything that is federally eligible. A set aside of that is called transportation alternatives and these TA funds are primarily used for bike and pet infrastructure. The next category is CMAC or congestion mitigation air quality. Um, projects that are funded out of this funding type must provide an air quality benefit by reducing emissions and congestion. 
Uh, finally, which is a new, a, a new funding type to Dr. Cog for this TIP cycle, um, the State Multimodal Transportation Option Fund. This is a new state source with a 50% match that came from the 2018 Senate Bill 1. Um, eligible project types included transit, TDM programs, uh, multi multimodal mobility projects enabled with new technology, studies, and of course, bike and ped projects. So as Dr. Cog worked through the TIP process for the regional share, um, there was approximately $32 million available. Uh, and this call happened uh, from the end of July through the middle of September. Uh, a total of eight projects were selected with this $32 million, uh, which provided a, a $179 million investment, um, which once you include total match, included uh, throughout the region. For the sub-regional share, um, of course, on the screen, you have your, your eight sub-regions with 113 total projects submitted with the approximately $209 million uh, that was available. Um, the sub-regions were able to select 82 projects for the call for projects that took place earlier this year. Um, those 82 projects provided over a half billion dollars of, of total investment for transportation within the region. Uh, if you break it down further for the $285 million that was available in both of these calls, um, you, and you take a look at the, the project types, um, just a couple things to note. Um, the first is the introduction of a multimodal project type. Um, a multimodal project is simply a project that contains both bike, pad, and transit elements. Uh, and secondly, it's the increase, the total increase in, in funding for bike and ped projects on, in the tune of $51 million, which is approximately 10 to $15 million over what we've, what we've had typically in the past uh, few cycles. When you take a, th take a look at the percentage of projects by type for these two calls for projects, um, you'll note that the bike and ped, in, uh, the bike and ped percentage um, is at 30%. Um, and again, that's an increase over the last couple of cycles for, of about 10%. And again, when you combine the bike ped transit projects, you have a, a total, um, total share of approximately 50%. Um, this public hearing is not only just the TIP, but it's also the air quality conformity documents for mobile sources. So the 20 to 23 tip must address um, ozone, carbon monoxide, and PM10 pollutants. Um, the regionally significant transportation projects that were included in the tip um, within the regional travel model um, were, were contained within the travel model that was ultimately run. Um, the tip passed all these pollutants once this model was run, and it passed the emissions test for the regional air quality conformity. Um, this air quality conformity, again, is based off of the regional mobile sources and looks at not only the RTP, it looks at the, the TIP along with the RTP as a whole, and it's not based on individual projects. So this public hearing is what we would call this capstone of this 30-day public comment period. Um, notification was sent out uh, via the typical sources of the website, social media, email blast, uh, newspaper. Uh, we even participated in the bike to, wait, bike to work day Civic Center station, um, inquiring um, bike to work day riders who were interested in the, in the tip. Um, something new this year, we've also introduced an online web map where applicant or, or um, the public could make comments if they wish. So just a quick on the remaining schedule um, for this document. Um, of course, we have the public hearing tonight, um, and we'll be turning around here next Monday um, to our Transportation Advisory Committee and be looking for their recommendation, followed up with the RTC um, recommendation August 20th, and of course, coming back to you in one month looking for your action to approve the TIP and the conformity documents. So with that, I'll take any questions or comments you may have. Any questions? All right, thank you very much, Cartel. Hearing is now open for those who have signed up to speak. Each speaker will have up to three minutes to testify. If you have not finished by the three minutes, I will ask you to conclude your remarks. When you're hearing, when you hear your name called, please approach the microphone area and present your testimony. I have a Kyle Burdell. 
want to speak? You didn't acknowledge if you wanted to speak or not. You need to go to the microphone if you'd like to address the board. Uh, I wasn't sure if, if I was going to say anything because I've already said everything and I appreciate the online map where you can add the comments rather than me saying for the next two hours I'm going to say what I want to say. Um, it, there's really not much more to say unless you would like my personal ideas and opinions on what needs to be done like with Santa Fe and State Highway 52 as a second ring road or, or expanding um, uh, State Highway 83 as an alternative to I-25. That could be turned into like I-425 or something al along those lines. So I'll just keep it like that. Okay, thank Thanks. you very much. Next up we have uh, Brandon Fignelio. Oh, Dad, there you go. That's from Arvada. Hey. Hey. <laughs> Hi, my name is Brandon Figliolino. I am really I, excited to see. I'm sorry, I ruined oh, your last name. It's all good. I didn't read it. <laughs> So don't hold that against my election this year. No, oh, definitely not. <laughs> <laughs> I am really excited to see all of the multimodal, ped, bike, and uh, transit options in this TIP plan. I just want to caution against strict road widening unless it serves a purpose for um, HOV or bus only uh, because we have seen that latent demand just increases the number of uh, cars that are on that road. Um, but I'm really excited to see the, the ped and bike infrastructure coming up. Thank you. Thank you, Brandon. Anyone else would like to address the board? Seeing none, are there any other questions from the board? Thank you. This brings tonight's hearing to a close. Thank you for your testimony and your interest. The board is currently scheduled to take action on the draft 2020-2023 tip on August 21st. Next up, report from the chair. Uh, first off, I want to uh, introduce everybody, if they haven't, we have a new Arvada Public Works Director that has joined our organization, uh, Mr. Don Wick. If you could just stand up, so I might know the name, 32 years in our police department. Uh, he was the last year, before he went to the private side for a little while, he was our chief of police for 11 years prior to that. And, you know, we just put him on the streets now and said, need to fix them. Um, so we're excited to have him on board. Um, he has driven them. Uh, many, yeah. <laughs> so I want to welcome him and uh, to the board and we're excited to have him on our staff. Uh, so I wanted to introduce him tonight. Uh, report from the chair on the uh, Regional Transportation Committee. <coughs> I, don't, I told Doug, I don't know why this is on here because you're going to get repeat of exactly what happened yesterday in this meeting. So. I'm not going to give a report because it's the same thing that you're going to hear in a few minutes. Um, next up, the Performance and Engagement Committee. Thank you, Chair. Um, we met this evening. We talked about the responses to the survey that you all participated in. Thank you very much for completing that. Um, the, there's some really good news. It looks like we have been improving year on year, so all of, all of our uh, data looks like we're generally going in the right direction. Um, we got these nice spark charts that show us our performance overall as an organization. It's a really great graphic way of looking at it, and our lowest performing years are all behind us. So um, if you get a moment to look through that data, it's in the performance and engagement packet. But things on the whole look very positive. And again, <coughs> thank you all for, for completing that. We also talked about the board workshop. There are some really great sessions on Friday. So check those out. And if you're interested in attending them, please email Connie and let her know which sessions you'll be attending. So there are three different topics, and you'll be able to make it to two of them. So if both you and your alternate register, you can split up between those and make it to all of the different topics. Um, if you have any questions about that, just let Connie or myself know, and we can help you get information on how to reserve a room and how to make sure you reserve for those mini courses. Thanks. Now, those that have not been there, um, this is some. This is a great workshop for those that have. And if you're new or haven't been, I strongly encourage you all to be there. Um, if you haven't registered, please do so quickly. Not too late, right? For the hotel. so till Tuesday. So please, please do that. It is probably one of the. Uh, most beneficial things I think we do at Dr. Cog, and I think that's also where we build stronger relationships and collaboration and get to know each other and our communities a little bit more. So please, please uh, sign up and be there. Uh, Director Jones. 
I just wanted to ask uh, Director Stolzman what the final um, response rate was on the survey. I, I don't remember the exact percentage, but it was like around 50% of the board responded. Despite all your badgering. <laughs> Correct. People should be inspired to do better next year. Any other questions or comments for Director Solzman? Oh. <laughs> I probably answer that. Uh, I think we had 31 total. 31 total, which was good. <laughs> Fortunately, I was one of the ones that she had a badger, so she did a good job. And uh, I did. Sorry, I apologize. Uh, next up, the Performance and Engagement Committee, or excuse me, uh, the Budget and Finance Committee. Thank you, the, the BNF Committee. Oh, sorry, I was trying to get away from F and B. Yes, that's right. <laughs> this is the, we're going to call it the BNF Committee now, not the F and B Committee. <laughs> the uh, we had two uh, resolutions authorizing the uh, executive director to uh, receive some uh, uh, funding from uh, two state agencies for two programs that are uh, that are pretty successful. Uh, one is from DORA for one year and uh, to uh, administer the Regional Senior Health Insurance Assistance Program, which helps, and Jayla, help me out if I say anything wrong, uh, which helps uh, our elderly navigate through the Medicare and the healthcare system. Uh, to, uh, I think there are three, uh, how, how many staffers? Four staffers and, volunteer, and two volunteers. And the other item was uh, up to $300,000 from the Colorado Department of Health, Healthcare Policy, Policy and Financing uh, to support the uh, AAA's Community Options Program, which uh, helps to uh, help seniors to transition out of uh, care facilities into places where they can find a, their, their place of choice uh, to continue living after uh, coming out of a long-term care. And, uh, and then we had a, uh, an informational report on the annual agency audit and uh, required no action. And uh, that was it. Uh, anybody have any questions? I'll be happy to entertain them. Any questions for Director Flynn? Seeing none, we'll move right along. Can I have Mr. Roger Partridge come on down? I want to recognize him for his five years of service to Dr. Todd. Next up, item number seven, report from the executive director. Mr. Rex. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first board workshop, I don't want to belabor the point, but I will just mention a couple of addition, additional uh, points associated with that. First of all, I mean, seriously, I, I think the comments were uh, quite right. This is a great event. It's a great opportunity for, for, uh, for you guys to, um, I, you, know, you know, really, really get an understanding of what your communities are doing and all that kind of good stuff. And it's, it's just, it's, just it's, a good, it's a good opportunity to get together. Um, so rooms must be booked next Tuesday, July 23rd. Uh, Performance and Engagement Committee did approve the final uh, agenda and it's the same one you have at your seats tonight. Um, and you know, p and &E works awfully hard on those agendas and I think we have a very, very good robust um, agenda this time. They actually um, narrowed or rem remove the number of agenda topics that we have this time. So we have you know, a lot of time in the morning to talk about the uh, Erie Agency on Aging program, we have about two, two hours and 15 minutes, and then two hours and 15 minutes in the afternoon to talk about some growth and development stuff. So I think it's a really, really good agenda, and, and I hope you, uh, if you're able, you can attend. Um, the rounds are on, Doug. That is not true. Friday night. <laughs> Friday night. We all know. I've been saying it for months. It's true. <laughs> Believe in it. <laughs> um, <laughs> See, your motion. I know, right? <laughs> so we are collecting community highlight posters again this year. We've done it over the last th uh, two or three years, and it was quite successful. And notice went out uh, to board members as well as to key staff within your communities. And um, um, 
so it has instructions on how to submit those and all that. But if you really do have questions, just reach out to myself or Brad Calvert, and we'll be happy to come out and get those posters. Well, ultimately, we'll make sure that they get up to Keystone. Uh, joint coordination. Dr. Cog has been coordinating joint outreach meetings with CDOT, RTD, and the Front Range Passenger Rail Commission. Um, as all four bodies begin important transportation planning efforts, uh, presentations have occurred jointly um, at the county transportation forum level. So far, uh, meetings have been held in Boulder, Weld, Clear Creek, Jefferson, and Douglas. Over the next few weeks, we'll be presenting uh, to the remaining counties, um, and we truly do encourage you all to attend that. I, I think it's great that we have that level of collaboration within this region, that all, all four of those groups can come together and, and have a uh, legitimate conversation. Metrovision Idea Exchange. Throughout the 2019 uh, year so far, we've been working with CU Denver to uh, co-host the in-person Metro Metrovision Idea Exchanges, but, and you know we've also included uh, opportunities to uh, to do these webinar um, exchanges as well. You have a handout at your at, at your place tonight that shows three upcoming uh, webinars on a variety of topics. You can register through through the Dr. Cog website on, um, uh, for those events, and we strongly encourage you to do so. Small Communities Hot Topics Forum. This is primarily for the new members, the new of the smaller communities out there. This is a specific event that we have for small communities. Um, we, we hold it once a year, and the date for this year's forum is Thursday, September 26th from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. So please save that date. We'll be getting some additional information out to you all. Um, and this year's topic is how to play in the smart city game. Uh, so if you have, if you want additional information this evening, please reach out to myself or Flo Rotano, who's, who really coordinates this event. It's a great event, and, and we strongly, strongly encourage you to participate. CDPHE funding opportunity. I remember earlier this year, I shared a funding opportunity that Dr. Cog has partnered with the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment to offer our um, member uh, jurisdictions an opportunity to apply for some small grants um, to pursue community scale projects that promote healthy, active, and well-connected communities. Um, so we, uh, so in May, I announced that Lakewood, Edgewater, Castle Rock, and Aurora were selected for those grants. Well, they had some additional funding over CDPHE, and um, they, they uh, were able to support two additional projects, one in Longmont and the other in Westminster. So congratulations to them. I don't know if you've been contacted yet, but if you haven't, Breaking news, you will soon. Um, another partnership opportunity that we, we have here at Dr. Cobb, we work with the Urban Land Institute to, um, uh, to um, host in, in our, in our uh, uh, member local governments a, a technical advisory panel, or TAP. Um, and did just this past week, the town of Erie had, had their TAP. And um, my understanding, it went extremely well. Great opportunity, great group of experts, and we really appreciate the opportunity. To great, thank you, sir, very much. And as you, as you may or may not know, Dr. Cog offers matching funds for these programs over the past several years. Um, and uh, let me see here. Uh, there, we've, well, Jefferson County, you guys are getting ready to do a tap in September. I'm Director Zabo. There. Yeah, right, so you guys are getting ready to do one in September, so if, uh, if you need, Anything from us, just please let us know. We will, would like to extend our appreciation to Castle Rock EDC um, as part of ARIES, Aries uh, TAP. Um, they, they shared some of their program and initiatives to their neighbor to the 50 miles to the north, so we appreciate all, all the work that you guys. So through the years, beside those two, we've also had, uh, funded TAPs in Boulder, Cast Castle Pines, uh, Denver, Englewood, and uh, Idaho Springs. So stay tuned to next year. The last thing I want to mention is a special shout out to uh, Director Jim Dale of Golden. Where's Jim? There he is over there. Jim was recently recognized by his, his alma mater, Kansas State University's College of Veterinary Medicine and the Veterinary Medical Alumni Association. Uh, the award recognized Dr. Dale for his outstanding achievements, humanitarian service, and contributions to the veterinary pr pr profession. Um, after graduation, Jim practiced in Lawrence, Kansas, <laughs> home of 
home of Big Brother University, the University Wait, of Kansas. Props? Until I know props and everything. I, and until he was he, until he was called to the Air Force. Um, Jim, just a little bit of info on Jim. Jim Jim retired as a full colonel, and his military decorations include five awards of the Meritorious Service Medal and the Legion of Merit. So, on behalf of I'm sure the Dr. Cog Board, we want to congratulate you on those awards, sir. You yeah. well well deserved. And that's my report. Yeah, that's my report, uh, Mr. Chairman, and Rock Chuck that. Jayhawk. You can remove that now. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Doug. Next up, the public comments. Up to 45 minutes is allocated now for public comment, and each speaker will be limited to three minutes. If there are additional requests from the public to address the board, time will be allocated at the end of the meeting to complete the public comment. The chair requests that there be no public comment comments on issues for which a prior hearing, public hearing has been held before this board. Consent and action items will begin immediately after the last speaker. Anyone here to speak to the board? What comment? Seeing none, we'll move right along to item number nine. Move to the consent agenda. Attachment B. If uh, somebody could look at that and make a motion to approve the consent agenda it includes the minutes of May 15th. I have a second. Second, all in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed? Abstentions, the motion carries. Moving into the action items, number 10, a discussion of a resolution amending the 2018-2021 Transportation Improvement Program Attachment Senior Packet. Mr. Cottrell, you may begin. Thank you. Uh, so for you this evening, we have two amendments for your consideration. Um, both uh, come from and be sponsored by RTD, and both use the same um, FTA funding source, so FTA Section 5339 discretionary funding. Um, the first project is for a plat facility roof replacement, uh, and this would add a little over $3.5 million in that discretionary funding plus the match. The second is for $7.5 million of the same funding um, and associated match for bus replacement. Um, both TAC and RTC have recommended approval, and we'll be looking for an action such as that for tonight. Thank you, Mr. Cottrell. Any questions uh, for, for him? Seeing none, I'll look for a motion. I'll move. Second. Those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed? Abstentions? That carries. Next up is uh, item number 11 on the action items, discussion of the approval of the 2020-2021 Unified Planning Work Program. Up, whoop. <laughs> Attachment D, that's for Ron, that's for Ron. He hates it, so. Thank you, Mr. Chair, really appreciate that. Oh, hey, you know what, John, where's Dyack? It's all him, he keeps yes. pushing me to do it, so. I asked you once. No. <laughs> So, Mr. Papstorf, you may begin. It's nice to know that everyone's in a good mood tonight. Uh, hi, for the record, I'm Ron Papstorf. from the Director of Transportation Planning and Operations here at Dr. Cog. Uh, good to be here. I'm going to take a little bit of time to kind of walk through the development and the context for the Unified Planning Work Program, simply because it's one of the core things that sort of drives our work as the region's transportation planning agency. Um, and we only do this every two years. We adopt a two-year work program that guides um, our work. So if you'll bear with me a little bit, I just want to walk through a little bit. So for those that are newer to this process, the Unified Planning Work Program, UPWP, really describes um, the proposed multimodal transportation planning activities that we're going to undertake as an agency and agencies, because it includes work by CDOT and RTD, as well as other reasonably significant planning efforts that local governments undertake around the region as well over the course of those two federal fiscal years, 2020 and 2021. Uh, as I said, we prepare, we prepare this every two years. 
it is the basis by which we expand federal planning dollars that are allocated to us as the regional planning agency. Uh, it's a management tool for scheduling and monitoring the work that we do over that two year period. Um, it's administered by Dr. Cog, but it really is a partnership between us and CDOT and RTD as sort of members of the cooperative planning effort for the region, as well as those local governments that participate in this work. <clears throat> So just a reminder, uh, you saw this earlier from Todd, uh, this really affects the work we do as the Metropolitan Planning Organization for the region, which covers um, the areas other than Gilpin and Clear Creek County and the rural parts of Eastern Arapaho and Adams County to the east. We have lots of partners uh, that I mentioned in our planning process, certainly RTD and CDOT, uh, but many other agencies work with us uh, throughout the course of our planning work. Um, some context for how we develop the UPWP uh, for the two-year period. There are some federally directed activities and tasks that we must do as the designated MPO for the region, including the Regional Transportation Plan, the Transportation Improvement Program, the congestion management process, and our planning process certification uh, with FHWA and FDA. Um, also, Metro Vision themes, outcomes, and measures really help shape the work that we uh, pursue over the two-year period. The Regional Transportation Plan has particular strategies that we can pursue uh, under the UPWP. And then there are federal transportation planning factors that we have to address in the UPWP as well. So I'm gonna walk through some of that context, starting with MetroVision first. Uh, there are several, there are five themes uh, in MetroVision uh, that help describe what we, our desired future is that you all have adopted. So an efficient and predictable development pattern, a connected multimodal region, safe and resilient natural and built environment, a healthy, inclusive, and livable communities throughout the region, and a vibrant, uh, regional economy. I'm kind of a transportation geek. I think transportation plays a significant role in achieving all of those themes long term or plays a, plays a significant role in our ability to achieve um, the, our goals under those themes. There are specific outcomes related to transportation in MetroVision as well, uh, including providing a range of transportation op opportunities, uh, investing in infrastructure and amenities that help people and businesses thrive and prosper across the region, uh, a well-connected multimodal transportation system for the region, um, providing healthy and active choices for folks and how they get around the region, and then um, a safe, reliable, and well-maintained system uh, for the region. Those outcomes uh, we track through specific transportation measures, um, including reducing or increasing the amount of non-single occupant vehicle mode share to work on uh, how people move around and get to work, reducing vehicle miles traveled per capita across the region, slowing the increase in the variation of travel time during peak periods, slowing the increase in person delay across the region, uh, reducing traffic fatalities, reducing transportation related greenhouse gas emissions per capita across the region, increasing the share of population in areas with affordable housing and transportation costs combined, so sort of um, transportation efficient locations so that reduce uh, the cost of living for folks, increasing the share of housing and employment near high frequency transit around the region. So those are things that we track. You've seen those before. Uh, we've talked about kind of how we're doing. Um, and one of our goals in developing the UPWP is make sure that we focus on efforts that will further our achievement um, towards those measures. Um, another, the last sort of big contextual piece for developing the UPWP is the Regional Transportation Plan. Um, it integrates with Metro Vision. It really provides, uh, under that framework, uh, based on population employment forecasts across the region, a multimodal transportation system um, that will help us achieve our regional goals. It does include a specific financial plan for how we will implement the RTP over time and is based on a significant amount of community engagement. Uh, and other topics around the region. And as we engage, and as some of you have started to hear, as we engage in the development of the next version of the Regional Transportation Plan, the 2050 plan, um, we'll be working through all of that again. So moving on to the last piece, the federal transportation planning factors, there are several uh, that are specifically laid out in the FAST Act. 
Uh, we are required to consider those planning factors in our transportation planning process in the region. And the UPWP activities that are listed in the document that you were provided a link to are organized for reference um, by those planning factors that, so that we can show how our, act, our, our proposed activities actually relate to those planning factors. I will not bore you by going through all of those. Um, I did want to highlight a few of uh, uh, the significant accomplishments that we had over the last two-year period, 2018 and 2019. Uh, we did adopt uh, a Title VI implementation plan for Dr. Cog uh, and reserve, received federal concurrence on that. That's our civil rights um, uh, portion of how we uh, do our planning in the region. We adopted um, all of the required transportation performance measures in partnership with CDOT and RTD for our, our region. Uh, that was a big undertaking and, and took a lot of coordination, a lot of work. Uh, we completed the active transportation plan in January of this year. Uh, we conducted, again, both, as you heard tonight, both the regional and sub-regional calls for projects. Sorry. <laughs> that was weird. Uh, for, the, for this next uh, TIP process, <laughs> we, <laughs> we've processed several sets of amendments to the current TIP. Uh, we've completed and updated uh, and maintained the regional ITS, the Intelligent Transportation System architecture for the region that helps um, define how we integrate our traffic signal systems around the region and improve the operations of the transportation system. Uh, we've provided significant technical assistance to several quarter studies, including the State Highway 119 Bus Rapid Transit uh, environmental analysis and completed uh, 2016 uh, foot, uh, regional aerial photography project and planimetric project that is a good basis of information that is provided to all of our member governments to help in their planning activities. So for the next two years, um, our, our objectives help organize the work program. The, acti the specific activities that we'll pursue over the two periods are identified and organized to support those objectives and specific tasks and deliverables are identified for each activity in the UPWP. Um, this is a significant work effort for our group. It represents um, almost $16 million of planned expenditures over the next two years uh, for planning services to the region. Um, I'll note that of that $16 million, $2 million is being set aside to participate in CDOT's statewide household travel survey. That is a new piece of information that we do about every 10 years or so collaboratively between us, CDOT, and the other metropolitan planning organizations around the state that helps us refine and um, make sure that our travel forecasting models are working and reflecting sort of today's conditions as well as they can. Uh, it does include over 25 specific deliverables that will be provided. It also identifies uh, specific planning activities by CDOT and non-federally funded local government planning activities around the region. Uh, some of those highlights include, as I said, the 2050 RTP will be a significant effort over the next two years. Um, we are proposing to expand uh, the amount of regional bicycle facility use counts that we uh, collect around the region to help inform our planning efforts and decision-making efforts around expanding the regional bicycle system. Uh, we are already convening and will continue to convene the regional mo uh, micromobility work group to help develop some shared framework for how local governments can deal with sort of these new emerging micromobility um, services uh, that, are, that are popping up across the region. Um, we will be preparing an assessment of the 2020-23 uh, dual model TIP process so that we get everyone's feedback and are prepared for the next TIP round and make any refinements that we want that we identify. Uh, we will complete the Regional Vision Zero Action Plan to really, as a region, address safety, uh, the, the rate and number of traffic-related fatalities and serious injuries in this region is a, is a, continues to be a significant concern for us. This is a little bit cutting edge, I will say. There are not many metropolitan planning organizations or regions around the state that are taking a regional approach. Uh, to Vision Zero plans. Uh, so we're learning a lot and um, hope that this will be a really significant effort um, and we'll learn a lot about this collectively, about how we all can take concrete steps towards uh, reducing serious injuries and fatalities. Uh, we will continue to work with CDOT, our partners uh, at CDOT, RTD, and other stakeholders on implementing specific actions that were identified in the Mobility Choice Blueprint. Uh, we are proposing to complete a regional transit-oriented development opportunity study. Todd 
study around the region, building on the really fine work that RTD has done over the last several years on looking at transitory development opportunities at light rail and commuter rail stations, but starting to take a more regional look at opportunities along high frequency bus routes and in preparation for uh, future investments in bus rapid transit corridors and trying to look beyond just the, the rail system to other opportunities for transit-oriented development in support of our local government members. Um, uh, that will lead to hopefully the identification of some priority locations where we can do some actual mobility hub planning uh, specific to those priority locations. Uh, as I mentioned, the household travel survey, and we are also going to complete a uh, perform a complete streets toolkit uh, in cooperation with local governments to really have a resource available to all of you and your jurisdictions on how to, uh, in best practices, really look at those streets where these treatments are appropriate to, um, and is a component to improving safety by reducing travel speeds where it's appropriate and really taking a more multimodal approach to those corridors in support of adjacent land uses. With that, I will conclude. I'd be happy to take any questions from you. Uh, we do have a uh, recommendation for approval from TAC and from the RTC yesterday morning. Uh, there's a proposed motion in the, in the packet in attachment D and um, would be happy to answer any questions. Any questions for Mr. Papsdorf? Seeing none. Mr. Dyack, did you want to say something? Okay. Looking for a motion uh, to approve the draft of the FY 2020, FY 2021 Unified Planning Work Program. Mr. Dyack? Move to approve the draft uh, FY 2020, FY 2021 up whoop. <laughs> <laughs> I have a second for Mr. Flynn. Those all in favor say aye. aye. Opposed? Abstentions. The motion carries. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Papsdorf. We're just sharing our love for you. Next up, number uh, 12 on your item, uh, informational briefings uh, about the regional transportation funding update. Attachment E, Mr. Rex. Thank you, Chuck. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and uh, good evening, everybody. And thank you for the opportunity to provide an update on this. I, um, uh, well, I'm, I'm going to preface my comments here real, real in a minute, but the, the whole concept associated with this, <laughs> who was at the February meeting? Were there are many that were not at the February meeting when we had a discussion about this? Several? I see a lot of confused looks. We're not quite sure. So we'll get into a little bit of the history associated <laughs> with this this evening. Um, I'll, I, yeah, that was a long time ago. There's no doubt about it. Um, so, so at the time, so so Metro Mayors, um, Metro Mayors at their annual retreat in January, uh, they had a conversation about many items, of course, and transportation funding was one of the ones that that they uh, that they really focused in on. And part of that conversation, they've been having conversations about. Uh, about a regional funding solution for several years, dates back to 2012, and even, quite frankly, even at Dr. Cog in the mid 2000s, um, there were conversations about the possibility of doing something regionally uh, to um, to find a mechanism to support the needs that that local communities have in this region. Um, so, so at 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 that meeting. Um, uh, they really were interested in three models, and I'll go through those three models here in a minute. Um, and at our, our February uh, 20th board meeting, uh, Director Atchison reported out on exactly you know the, the conversation that was had at the uh, at the uh, Metro Mayor's Caucus annual retreat. You know, before I I mean I go any further, I just want to preface exactly what it is we've done to date. Um, we, I have not, let me start by what I, what I haven't been given direction to do, and that is pursue legislation. Um, and that was quite clear. What we, what we believe we have re um, direction to do was one, was to form a work group between ourselves, Dr. Cog and Metro Mayor's Caucus, and that, is, uh, that work group is, is um, uh, made up of, at least on the Dr. Cog side, by the executive committee and representation of our counties because obviously Metro Mayor's Caucus is um, only municipalities. And we've met probably, oh, I don't know, three or four times since, since that time to, to uh, you know, talk about the issues. And it's a complex issue. There's no doubt about it, right? Um, 
So, I mean, the whole concept really was with the failure of 110, there, there was a growing interest again to begin to have conversations about what solutions do we have at the regional level to, um, to our transportation funding problem. <clears throat> So I'm just going to go into a little bit of detail before I talk about the, the model specifically. Um, and so the current situation, you guys know this better than I do. You know, we, we have, there, there's, a shorting, there's, a, there's a funding shortfall in, in local governments. Maintenance needs are getting backlogged, and the further backlogged they get, the, the more needs you have, and, and, and we know that's a problem. Um, one, of, one of the, one of the, the, uh, the possible benefits of doing something on a regional level is that you don't have an, a situation or an environment where um, there's, there's f as mentioned here, there's, there's a threat of fracture. And we're, truly what that means is that there's, no, there, there's the potential of, of, uh, of not a lot of continuity of the entire regional network. Um, and speaking to the infrastructure, right, you could have just a patchwork of a quilt of haves and have-nots throughout the region. And um, so there was, there was interest from at least Metro Mayor's Caucus in having a conversation further about that. So all roads are local, well, almost. Uh, so in, within, within the state, almost se nearly 75% of the paved lane miles are uh, maintained by local jurisdictions. And you can see that here. So this, I mean, that's, that's a significant amount of investment that occurs at the local level to uh, make sure that our that our, um, our roadway miles are, are, uh, are maintained to the degree that, they, that we all hope they should be. So at the, at the regional mobility level, and I think what we hope to accomplish with the exploration of this, of, of, of this, this whole task is to, um, um, you know, from the, is to have regional mobility tools that create a climate in which you know we can accelerate local and and regional priorities, address uh, congestion, pavement conditions, and mobility needs, and allow each region throughout the state, whether that be through the metropolitan planning organizations such as Dr. Cog, or and it could be transportation planning regions throughout the state, to kind of establish their own priorities and equity and rates and all that kind of good stuff, kind of kind of define their own destination. <coughs> So let's talk about the three models that, that, have, that were discussed in back in February and were discussed at the Metro Mayor's Caucus. So the first is, is already in state statute, and they all have their own pros and cons, of course. The first is regional transportation authorities. There's, I believe, seven throughout the state right now. And um, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, of course, is already in statute, is well tested. The problem with a region of our size, of course, is that we have 58 member local governments. And the uh, complexities associated with trying to get, and I'm not naive enough to think that everyone would sign on to something like that, uh, it would be very difficult, maybe even unwieldy, to try to get um, as many councils as possible. So what would happen is that the, each council would determine whether they would want to sign on to an IGA uh, to ultimately go to a vote. And so there would obviously have to be agreement on what the IGA stated, how much the ballot initiative would be for, those types of things. And it's, it's just, it's, it's a lot in this region. Colorado Springs has an RTA, and it works uh, quite well. It's been, it's, it's been re-upped at least once, maybe twice, Ron? Twi in, on two separate occasions. Um, and the approval rating has been quite, quite good. But I think there's only like four members within that, that uh, RTA, so it's, uh, it's a little more manageable. The, um, the, second, the second model is, is what, we, what we call the Metro Transportation Collaboratives. So basically what would this would be, it would be a new creation in statute where you would define the geography of the area in which you would like to have the taxing authority. It's really, it's the, RT, it's the RTD model. Right, Bill? I mean, that's basically what this is. So the difference really between the first and the second one, so the first one, the RTA would require two votes. Um, uh, uh, ballot questions. You would have to have a vote to, uh, to set up the authority, and then two to ask for the funding. So in the second, oh shoot, in the second model, <laughs> in the second model, um, you really only requires one, one vote because um, the actual authority is established through statute. So, so, the, so the vote would be for the funding, for, to, fund the, um, to fund the authority. So, and last but not least, and this is really um, the one that was 
that was most different from the other two. Uh, it was something that, we, that was originally being called em Empowering Existing Bodies, or boards. Um, it was later changed to uh, Empower Metropolitan Planning Organizations, or EMPO. And the whole concept associated with this would be give metropolitan planning organizations around the state taxing authority. Um, this is not unprecedented. There are states throughout the country in which, which this, this does happen, uh, most notably California. In, uh, in Oregon, there's a, there's, a, um, a, there's a mechanism such as this, and there, there are a couple others out east as well. Um, so this is the one, because it was so new to us, that we spent the most time trying to explore. And, um, you know, there are some, some, clearly some value to this. I mean, there's already a governing body that would be established right through the Dr. Cog board. It has representation of every community within, within the, the, the metropolitan area and all, the, all those types of good things. But it's, it's clearly not a, fix, a, qu a quick fix. And we, I think we've noticed that through the work group, just trying to determine, you know, um, you know what the, the, the true governance would be associated with this. Um, you know, what the ballot initiative would state with regards to uh, funding source, funding amounts, all those things. There is a lot, a lot of complexity that we would need to flush out in order to finally get there. But I think the conversations have been very good thus far. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it's something we're just clearly at the infancy in this. We're nowhere close to, uh, to make any kind of recommendations back to the board associated with. So, um, just so you know, in case you don't know, there are five metropolitan planning organizations throughout the state. We, we are we're by far the biggest of, of those. Um, the five MPOs, they run, there's four along the Front Range. You have Fort Collins, the North Front Range MPO. Uh, then you have us. Then you have uh, uh, Pikes Peak Area Council of Governments. Then you have the Pueblo MPO. And then Grand Junction out, in the, out on the Western Slope. Those are the five. They represent 83% of the population of this state. So that's uh, um, so that was you know somewhat attractive if you're trying to trying to um, you know develop a uh, a regional approach for for the the majority of those within the state. And I will say this: this is simply a tool. The fact that. Even if it were created in statute, it would just simply be a tool in the toolbox, right? It's not something that, at that point, any, every individual MPO can make a determination whether they wanted to use this instrument or not. And um, uh, yeah, I'll just leave it there. So speaking of the toolbox, um, again, there are there are plenty of things that are that are um, you know are, that are pending, especially the debrucing measure on the 2019 ballot. There are also some other things that are being considered, most notably the trans bonds, which was um, which was postponed to the 2020 ballot that was uh, that was created through Senate Bill One. Um, and there's been discussions through the years. Indeed, uh, CDOT has been involved in a in a pilot on on the uh, road use charge uh, to replace the fuel tax which, uh, you know, we're getting diminishing returns on that because of fuel economies and, and, and the like. Um, so we truly do see this as just a tool in the box for consideration by, uh, by, by the collective community as, as a whole. So that is kind of where we are. Um, let me just tell you a little bit about you know, some, some of the outreach and that that we've done. Uh, so part of the work group uh, conversations, we reached out to our own legal counsel to get an opinion about, well, first, is this even possible, right? As an MPO, could we create something in statute that would, that would not conflict with other things that would allow us to do this? Um, our legal counsel believes that is possible. Where that language would be located, um, there's a couple, three possibilities for that. Uh, we look primarily at the intergovernmental relationship statute, which seems to be appropriate, and that statute allows government, um, two or more government, uh, government entities to contract with a third party to do what they're legally uh, obliged to do in statute. So, um, so we looked at that, and we, we have some ideas and concepts that we've talked about with the work group, and we'll continue to do so. The other is the possibility of, in the RTA statute of creating kind of a, um, an MPO section to that, because what this really is is kind of a streamlined uh, RTA concept. Uh, well, I'm not sure exactly what that looks like, but it's something I think we wanted to explore. So it, if, if your region had an MPO, 
then you could probably then within this RTA statute, then you can defer to that more streamlined concept. Um, and you know, the remainder of the state that did not have an MPO, the complexities of an RTA are 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 not as great because there's just not many jurisdictions. So it seemed to work. Um, we've also had some conversations with uh, some legislatures gets just to get opinions and what's uh, upcoming on, uh, on, on, you know, within whether that be legislation or future ballot questions and the like. We reached out to Senator Faith Winter, who's the chair of the um, uh, Transportation and Energy uh, Committee in the Senate. And we had a great conversation with her about this. Um, I think she, she, she's intrigued by the concept for sure. Um, but she, she, um, she recommended we reach out to the governor's office and have a conversation, which we did. And uh, we, uh, uh, we had a meeting scheduled with Carrie Kennedy on Monday, just this past Monday. Two hours before the meeting, get a call that the governor was gonna, gonna drop in. So there you go. And uh, so we, we really did. And that conversation, we explained the three models and all of that. And um, I think he was, he was intrigued by it also. I think um, Governor Polis has always, always stated that he's open, he wants to hear some new ideas, right? New concepts on how to solve the problem. So I think he was, he was appreciative of, of the idea that we came forth with something new. But we really spent a lot of our time just talking about transportation in general. And he, and he even readily admitted that you know the solution is not only going to be a state solution. It's going to happen at the local level, regional level, what have you. It's a, it's an all-in approach. And um, so it, uh, and we we talked for about an hour. Uh, and Carrie Kennedy was in there too, as well as uh, Chief of Staff Lisa Lisa Kaufman. Um, and also, just to finish this up on who we're planning on meeting with. Um, uh, Representative Matt Gray, we also re, uh, have a meeting scheduled with Matt. Uh, he, and of course, he's chair of the Transportation and Local Governments Committee, just to get his concept and feedback on the issue as well. So as far as next step, you know, I, and again, I think this is the conversation we wanted to have with you tonight about, you know, how far you wanted us to go with this concept. I don't want to get too far over, to over my skis on this. Um, without your input and direction, are there specific things you would like to know more about? I think ultimately what we're trying to do in this exploratory stage is just get enough information together that we can provide you with, you know, with as perfect information as possible about this concept that you can make a determination at some future date whether to pursue this or not. So with that, I will uh, stop and take any questions, comments you might have. Questions for Mr. Rex? Yes. Um, being located in one of the areas that's not in the MPO, are there other, in the other MPOs in the state, are there similar um, chunks of land, municipalities, counties, whatever, um, that are excluded and how, I mean, when we talk about MPO, oh. it's, no, that's a great question. I, I honestly don't know the answer to it, but I, I would suggest at least it, the way I was thinking about it is that it would be all of Dr. Cog's communities. It's just we, we have an MPO function here at Dr. Cog, yes, but it would be all communities within the Dr. Cog boundary, whether they're in the MPO or not. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Yes, Ms. Jones. Could you explain a little bit more about the EMPO model in terms of so if we got the legislative authorization to do this, then we would vote at this table on whether or not to do it, Correct. and we either would be all in or all, or we wouldn't do it. So, so it would be a little bit different than the RTA where some people, some jurisdictions might choose to participate and some wouldn't. Sure, yeah. No, I, I think that's exactly right. At least that's the concept that's being discussed within the work group, right? I mean, there could be situations in which there could be some kind of out clause with, for members, you know what I mean? And then have a subset of the board. I mean, this is, we haven't had those intimate conversations, but you could see situations in which that would occur. And then we would, for a vote, we would still go back to our voters and authorize whether or not we wanted to rev increase revenue some, in some way. Correct. Thank you, Director Jones. Yes, Director Wynn. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> My 
question is, if there is revenue uh, authorized by the jurisdictions, um, is there any way, any way at all that this money could end up in the hands of the state general fund? And I wouldn't want that to happen. I would want it to go direct to the organization, so that's my question. Right. Um, I, I mean, I, I, I don't believe so. I mean, the concept would be that the money would flow, the majority of that money would flow unencumbered to all the local communities within, within that geography. Yes. So, no. Yes, so no. <laughs> Thank you. Director, Director Partridge? Or should I say Director Roger? <laughs> yes. We'll go with first names tonight. Just Roger, that's fine. <laughs> Doug, is there uh, any questions raised, any legal counsel on any Tabor issue? No, other than the fact that you would need, I mean, it would require a ballot initiative, right? So if this board uh, determined that this is something they wanted to pursue, if it were in statute, then uh, it would require, obviously, a vote of the people. So, I mean, so that would be the Tabor requirement. Thank you. Director Williams? With the EMPO, I see on here, it says we require uh, the five MPOs. Would legislation, would that legislation be required to include all five of those MPOs? Well, I think it, it was, it, that was more of a strat, I mean, it truly was a strategy with regards to working with the legislature. I think it's more palatable to, the, to include all the MPOs throughout the state um, to, to allow them the opportunity to, you know, take advantage of such legislation if it existed. Yeah. Director um, Stolzman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I, I really appreciate all the discussion tonight, and I'm trying to listen very closely um, so that in my role on the executive committee, I can re represent this group well. Um, the next comments I'm going to make are just from my perspective as a Louisville representative, but whatever the will of this group is, of course, as an executive committee member, that's what I'll do. Um, but from our perspective, it seems like it is more straightforward if there is going to be a huge local share back of this, if this is for local projects, that it's much more straightforward to do this as a local taxing mechanism. We can do that ourselves. Um, we don't have to, I mean, th th it's just much more straightforward. Um, we can fund the most important, highest priority projects to our community. Um, e even if it were to be at the county level, it makes more straightforward sense to us. Now, on the other hand, if this is for regional projects, if we say that we want 80% you know, of this funding to be for projects that are of regional nature, then it would make sense to us to do this through some other way, like a state tax or something like this. But if this is truly to be divided back to the local level, this just seems like a lot of ec extra bureaucracy to get to that. Um, so that's just one thing, and uh, I have a response or just sort of a different take on uh, Director Shaw's comment. So. While this money I don't think could directly go to CDOT, there is a question that I personally have as to if this would supplant CDOT funds. So if they just choose to stop funding things in our region, which of course they could do, um, that because we have this additional tax, then who's going to pay for those state roads? So I think it needs to be clearly defined if this tax money is going to supplant existing funding. Thank you, uh, Director, did you have? Director Odoricio. Yeah, I uh, I appreciate those comments. I think that the question about if there's gonna is this gonna simply be a pass through back to the locals, or is there gonna be some sort of capture for uh, regional pot? Um, we needed to have that discussion uh, at the outset of this effort, as well as understanding. Um, I think it needs to be clear that RTD and CDOT and those things. This would be us coming up with our share locally, and not to supplant. I think that's a very valid concern to make sure that people are realize we're not filling in their gaps, we're trying to meet our obligations. So I think that's a very fair question to ask uh, early on in the process. Very true. Director Peck. Thank you. Um, actually, uh, your comments were basically what some of the things that I was gonna ask, but 
Since you said that this would be nothing more, the MPO would be nothing more than a tool in our toolbox, I'm wondering if it wouldn't be worth it to go after the legislation for a statute and just keep it there so that we don't have to readdress this in, in five or 10 years, um, but also go after local funding and just keep that in our hip pocket that we have the ability to do that. But I am concerned that regardless of the funding we go after, that we don't include CDOT and RTD in the process um, because they are our major funding sources at this point. And I don't want to exclude them. Uh, I feel like in Prop 10, we didn't get RTD's uh, input as much as we should have. Oh, very good. It's a good comment. Ms. Chamberth, my no. answer. Um, so I, I, I know that Metro Mayor's Caucus has had conversations with uh, Director Liu from CDOT about this concept. Um, and RTD, Dave Genova specifically, has been in the work group meetings. So they have been involved in the conversations. I might just speak to the, to the comments that were made, which I fully agree about the CDOT investment. We want to make sure that we're just not supplanting that money. Um, <laughs> at, at the bottom of this, I think it's this one. Yeah, bottom of this slide, um, it, it, it makes mention of a hold harmless clause in there. So in the in it would it would be similar to the the clause that's in the uh, regional transportation authority statute currently. That uh, basically that CDOT could not supplant. They still need to invest in in the region. The comments. Any other question? Comments. Great. Yes. Yeah. I'm sorry, Director Peck. Uh, to that hold harmless clause and um, Mr. Uh, Dan Meter can correct me if I'm wrong, but that hold harmless clause is also in the RTD, uh, I don't know if it's a contract or our district acceptance of it. And because of that, we cannot demand from RTD or sue them or do anything. So I have a problem with those hold harmless clause, uh, unless it's done very, very carefully, <laughs> that if a local jurisdiction does not get what it is paying taxes for, we continue to pay taxes and don't get it and can do nothing about it because of the hold harmless clause. So I think that we all need to look at that very carefully if we're looking at regional pots of money that we that, that's equitable. Any other comments, questions? I think we, some of the concerns that some of the executive committee had is, you know, staff's been spending some time on this, executive committee has as well, and we think it's important that the, we have this discussion early into this process and make sure we don't get ahead of, like uh, Doug said, our ski tips on this. And um, I think I would look for if the board in, in general is, is supportive of uh, continue to research these toolkits uh, as long as we continuously to get updates. I don't know if that should be a motion or a comment or what, but it's uh, Director Jones. I think it's fine to keep having conversations and collecting information. I think that I, I associate myself with Director Stolzman's comments around and I've said this before, so I don't want to be redundant, we are constantly going to be comparing each option with what we could do individually or in any other forum. And so um, a nod to continue exploration should not be interpreted as a yes, we're, we're thinking that we would want to use the tool. Mm -hmm. But I do think it makes sense for, for all options around transportation funding to be on the table and for Dr. Cog to be actively um, engaged in helping lead those conversations. And I think the question comes is when you start meeting with the governor and you start meeting with legislators, I think we as a board need to be at least from a compass perspective in agreement of the exploration because we are engaging a lot of legislators in the conversation and that might give a signal that we are supportive in where we're going when we did not have that discussion at this table. So that, that, that's my concerns and I think same with Director Solzman has shared those as well and that's what I want to look to this team. Yes, Director Molika. So, and I agree with Director Jones, and I, I think that it's important to have this conversation, but, um, and I do see this as a possible tool for regional funding, um, but when it comes back to, you know, local share back, um, I think that that's really important because, 
you know, we really want to make sure that you know, our taxpayers are getting what they're paying for. Um, and I think that that's an important key that we're we're going to need to continue to bring up and make sure that all of these opportunities give us, you know, that freedom and flexibility. That. So I think for a regional project, this makes sense. Um, but if we're looking for local specific projects, I don't know. Yeah, we'll have to, to keep looking into Director Teal. Thanks, Chair. Um, along the last couple of comments, you know, there's a realistic reason to continue the conversation is if this does come up, let's say, in the next legislative session, we really do need to have our ducks in a row in terms of what we as an organization uh, would advocate for. Otherwise, I think we're going to see that, you know, um, we, we will be tagging along the process like I think we, I feel like we had with 109 and 110 over the last couple of years. So yeah, I think we need to keep working on it. And, you know, I, I agree with Elise here in terms of the, uh, you know, it's not a, I'm not gonna tell any of my constituents. <clears throat> You shouldn't tell yours either. <laughs> yeah, she took a selfie. <laughs> Pretty much. But the, the idea that, yeah, this is not consent, that yes, we love the plan and we're going to do it, but at the same token, yeah, let's keep moving forward, but just so we can have a plan uh, prepared for the next legislative session if that does become an issue. Director Partridge. Mr. Chair, thank you for asking the question because I think it's a very important thing because I know it has taken a lot of staff time and it has taken a lot of time uh, in the metro area. A uh, couple of comments regarding local. In Douglas County, we already have put on a ballot for November a redirecting a tax that was to expire to go to transportation. So locally, we are already. And one thing I really want to do is to put the support to CDOT which in a way, I don't think this does that. As what we're seeing is that it's being, from the executive and the legislative level of our state, I believe they're bailing on us and they're leaving it up to us locally to solve the problem and then become a greater share for not our roads under our jurisdictions, but state roads that go through our jurisdictions. And that's how we're getting projects done and CDOT knows it. I really think we have a great model already. I think we need to support CDOT. We have, a, again, a wonderful model. Who isn't being funded? It's CDOT appropriately. Now, I really appreciate state legislature, uh, I don't remember the bill, but the HUTF, HUTF funds that came to each city and county this year. That was wonderful. That's the right approach. So with that, has this committee really looked at saying, we need to band together to look forward to true legislation like we did with 110 to support. Have we really said, why don't we band together and put that as option D, let's go push to the governor and the legislators to really put the funding towards one of the key functions of government. Has that been done? Well, at the, at, uh, with the work group, you mean, Roger? Yes. Uh, no, I mean, it really truly wasn't the mission of that of that work group. But I will say, I mean, I think we still remain, um, you know, I don't know if optimistic, but at least we're, we're supportive of a statewide solution to, to the problem, right? And uh, we continue to be. But I think in the absence of that, and I think there will be some initiatives that are upcoming that are statewide, um, you know, I think we're just looking for things that we can expand the toolbox ultimately. And I, but I, but I, I mean, I, you're right. Uh, so, so I wouldn't be in favor necessarily have a, a lot more staff time on this. Um, I think we have a direction, but it's that in a general that we have greater discussion among ourselves. What do we really want? Because we're looking at it right here. It's become we local are going to have to start putting more money to state roads. Maybe we ought to look at saying, why don't we eliminate the executive and legislative branch control over CDOT. Let's keep the Transportation Commission, let's keep CDOT, and let's have the 10 TPRs and the five MPOs be the direction to that. Let's take the governor and the legislative out of control over CDOT. God, I hope you don't want me to answer that. <laughs> we don't want to go on the record. Innovative approaches. 
No, um, no, thank you very much. I mean, these comments have been very useful for us tonight, and we'll, we'll, we'll continue to pursue it, and we'll, we'll bring you back more frequent updates with regards to where we are. But I think ultimately we'd like to get you enough information that you can make a, a you know, a, make a decision one way or the other. So we'll continue to do that. Mr. Chairman, if I may, there's one more uh, point. Actually, I, I want to comment back on Roger's comments, not the end there, because... I had a flash of Boulder having their own Excel energy issue and doing their own energy for a minute, and should we go down that path? But, um, you know, when you say about the, the uh, locals paying on the state highways, I'm thinking of a project that we have in our city where we're paying $6.8 million out of our cash, not a penny out of the state, to fix an intersection on Indiana, which is State Highway 72. I think Douglas County has some other things as well that you've done out of your own coffers. I think we're already doing that, and I don't know if we'll ever get away by holding CDOT accountable for the roads that they have within our, our jurisdictions, um, because that didn't happen for us, no matter how many times we complained or escalated it or, or anything like that. We ended up, the pressure of our constituents said, you have to fix this. And so we diverted $6.8 million, which is a, a little bit less than half of our maintenance money to just fix one intersection. And um, I think if we try to go that way, I think it just gets worse. Or, you know, we, we've, I think there's something we have to pull back into our control. And when will that be fully open? Constituent <laughs> 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 of mine, uh, Director Zabo, uh, we're trying to get it open fast for you. <laughs> it's not happening fast enough. Now, in that one, we could say it's a state highway and it's CDOT's problem, even though we're paying for it. Um, Mr. Any Mr. other Chair, questions? We, yeah. Mr. Chair, thank you for those comments. I think you're going to reprimand me and say, <laughs> don't come back in another five years. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure my story's not alone in that. I think a lot of us are doing it. No, definitely not. Even regional, right? You know, our tip, over 60% of our monies are spent on, are, are going towards state, state highways, so state facilities. So you're right. Um, the last thing I want to mention, and this is something we feel feel strongly about, and I'd like to have more conversation with you all. We feel some of the com some of the problems that existed with 110 was was um, you know the ballot ballot dropped so late, you know there wasn't a whole lot of opportunity for public education and all that public awareness about what infrastructure costs. Um, and all that kind of good stuff. So we we really have had a, a, a conversation about um, the possibility of of maybe at the, us and the communities pooling our money to do a more comprehensive public awareness campaign to explain how the money is used, where it comes from, the cost of infrastructure. I had a you know a good friend of mine. We were having a conversation about this, and the I-25 Arapaho interchange opened up you know last year, whatever it was. And I asked him, I said, how much do you think that intersection cost, that interchange cost? And this is someone, he's an engineer, by the way, um, not civil, and he said, uh, and he said, 1.2 million, Jeez. and I'm like, we couldn't even get the... We couldn't get the design work done for 1.2 million. So, I mean, so there is, there's this, there's this void of information associated with, and then when I explain, that's right, it was $90 million. And it just, you know, and it's interesting when you have a conversation with people, you know, in the transportation sector, we haven't had a raise since 1991. It's the last time fuel tax have been increased in the state. And, uh, well, at state level, federal level, 92. So, you know, and I, I asked them, it's like, I like, you know, I like to see you raise your household based on what you were making back in 1991. And, it and all of a sudden, it triggers with them, right? They, they understand it more. And I think we just need to do a better job of that. So we'd like to have some further conversation with you all about this. And if we were never to do a regional initiative, it could, it, whatever, this public awareness campaign could help with your local initiatives, it could help on a state initiative, all the above. So I think it's something I hope you're open to have more conversation about. With that, I'm done. Yes, uh, Director Dell. Yes, I, th I think the mayors have beat this around quite a bit and they've thought, are very thoughtful about it. And uh, we voted down 110 and we deserve what we got. But the mayors have an idea about bringing together some funds. And as a fairly new guy here, I thought maybe the TIP process this year wouldn't work as well as it did. And I was very, I thought it was very well done. And how well we in the counties and the cities work together to set lots of agreement. And I would see if we got a pool of money, that, and we could do it equitably. And that, that Dr. Cog could uh, establish parameters for that because 
there's there's so much that needs to be done in transportation and there's no there's not enough dollars to do it so we need more funds from my perspective so I respect what the Metro Mayor's caucus, uh, caucus has done, and I, I would urge that we go forward look at exploring this. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Yes, Director Mullica. Um, I agree. I think that regardless of where we move forward, this could help everybody. Um, regardless of wherever it is we're trying to go, either locally, regionally, or at and so um, I, I really support this effort. I think especially in my community, um, we need to have more of this education and to also kind of offset the distrust that the community has had, especially with transportation taxes, not seeing the transportation um, options that we were promised. And so um, I think that it's essential, um, at least for my community. Okay, thank you. Any other comments or questions? Yeah, I think it was a great idea to look at an ad campaign. You know, when we talk about the urban drainage uh, flood district, they did a great job with that. And if you looked at how they approached it, it was a lot of education. And so when it came to the vote, it was kind of like a no duh at the time and the voter supported it. I think it would behoove us as an organization to encourage staff to at least do some educational similar things like that. Um, because I think still there's a thing that Dr. Cog is a person and don't realize uh, what we really do. They, they get confused between Papa Cog, Dr. Cog. Was it? Papa. <laughs> what? I didn't, I didn't hear that comment. Hey. Uh, okay, I think we're, we're done. I forgot where we were. <laughs> Number 13, moving right along. We are going to the AAA brief, the basics, uh, attachment F in your in your packet, Jayla Sanchez Warren, please. Good evening. I'm Jayla Sanchez Warren, the director of the Area Agency on Aging. Um, I'm so happy to get the opportunity to talk with you. I'm going to talk to you over the next uh, few meetings uh, because there's a lot of new people, and you probably don't know a lot about the Area Agency on Aging. Uh, we're going to talk about the basics tonight. In August at the board meeting, we're going to talk about the demographic shift and what's happening in the aging population and what the challenges and the opportunities are, and then a discussion of needs. I recently did um, a area plan on aging, and we'll, talk, uh, we'll, we'll take a little deeper dive into the needs in the region that we identified. At the board meeting, we're going to talk about the efforts at the state and federal level to reduce health care costs. This is a big, big issue in the state and at the federal level. Um, we'll talk about the opportunities for the Area Agency on Aging in this effort to reduce health care costs, and then how we're going to build capacity for all of these older adults that are coming down and will be living in our region. Let's just start from the basics. We're a federally mandated program. Uh, we get our authority under the Older Americans Act at the federal level and the Older Coloradoans Act at the state level. There are area agencies on aging in every part of this country. There are 622. There are 16 in the state of Colorado. We are the largest area agency on aging in Colorado, actually in the eight state uh, region. Um, So here's your elevator speech. What does the Area Agency on Aging do? A lot of people are like, I, I don't know, help old people? Yeah, we help people age better, right? Um, and we do that in a variety of ways. We provide information and services here through the AAA, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. We fund a bunch of community service providers. We identify gaps and fill those gaps and then plan for future needs. And we are federally mandated to advocate on behalf of, the, of older adults and their caregivers uh, in, in many areas, and I'll talk, I'll talk to you about that as well. I have been here 30 years at Dr. Cog. <laughs> Thanks. That was me a long time ago. Um, and, you know, I didn't get information from 30 years ago. The oldest report I could find was from 1997. We've changed a lot in that time. Um, we had nine staff 
15 volunteers. They were all volunteer ombudsmen, and I'll tell you about that program in a minute. We had three internal programs, 16 contracts, and we had a budget of $2.6 million. And I remember how proud we were of that at that time. Well, now we have 52 staff, six volunteers. They're all in the SHIP program, the state health insurance program. We have 14 internal programs, 37 contracts, and $27.6 million budget. This tells you a little bit more. The three programs we had were the Ombudsman Program, the Information and Assistance, which we've always done, and then Contracts Management, managing those contracts. Uh, we still have those, those um, same programs. We did have a part-time planner, which was kind of shocking to me. I did remember that after I saw that. Um, but now we've added so many more things like options counseling, the SHIP program, the veterans directed program, um, and accountable health communities, as well as several evidence-based programs um, uh, uh, courtesy of the Administration on Community Living. Every AAA is required to serve or to fund or provide services in these service categories. So you'll th see things like assisted transportation and, and um, home delivered meals and congregate meals and disease prevention and health promotion, transportation services, homemaker services. These are all requirements of the Older Americans Act and every area agency on aging in the country must provide at least these services. Either you provide them or you fund them. In the metropolitan area, we're fortunate because we have lots of com local community service providers. So these are our funded contractors right in, in 2019. You can see that we do a lot of work with the counties. Um, we, do, we fund the Alzheimer's Association. We fund Catholic Charities going on to the second page, sorry. Um, uh, Jefferson County Mental Health, uh, Senior Hub in, in um, Adams County, Mount Evans uh, in Gilpin that serves Gilpin and Clear Creek, uh, Tri-County Health P Department that serves the Eastern Plains because our ter territory goes all the way out to Deer Trail, and then Volunteers of America. So these are all the organizations that we fund. Some of them have multiple contracts with us to fund different kinds of services. So you may see transportation and chore service and caregiver support under one agency. There are a whole lot of things that have made us, so what, what happened is there's a lot of forces that have made us change. We've done most of our change in the last 10 years. And that was driven primarily by the demographic increase a lot of older people in the metropolitan area. We had also the big part of our funding came from the federal government and the federal funding went stagnant and was very inconsistent. So sometimes we'd get it on time and sometimes we wouldn't. If you recall a couple of years ago, I was really worried we were gonna have to stop transportation services and nutrition services in the metropolitan area because we were literally three weeks away from running out of our state funds because we hadn't gotten our federal funds yet. So we had to be innovative. And we said, what do we need to do? Well, we need to get more state dollars, and thanks to Rich Morrow um, and our la uh, la lobbying team at the state, we have gotten more funding. So therefore, we were able to create more programs or provide more service. We had to, de we had to develop new partnerships. We had to diversify our funding. How are we going to serve these people um, when we can't depend on the funding? Our community-based providers are fragmented and they have um, limited capacity. Uh, so how do we make sure that people get service in Adams County, get the same kind of service in Douglas County, right? We want to make sure that all of our older adults benefit from these. These were the forces that kind of pushed us. And we said, we've got to do business. If we want to be relevant in the future, we have to do business differently. And so we started to do that. We were also getting pressure in a number of ways. So this is kind of how some of these new programs came to be. 
the long-term care ombudsman information assistance and contracts management grew just because there were more people and more need. Um, the the evidence-based programs and options counseling and case management, these are all internal programs, were mandated by the Administration on Community Living, which oversees us. Um, the Latino case management program came about because the Latino um, population is the next big age wave and we don't already, we don't serve them well now. And if we don't serve them well now, the chances of them having to go into a higher cost healthcare system in the future um, is great. The Elder Refugee Program and the Veterans Directive Program were um, recommendations, that's why I say recommendations, strong recommendations by the Administration of Community Living. You should do this, this is really important. I got calls from our federal director often encouraging me to go in this direction. Um, the state said, please, please help us, we need your help. We need your help with the SHIP program and with Community Transitions, that program that moves people from from nursing homes back out into the community. And then there were opportunities. A lot of federal grants have come our way. Our latest and our biggest is the Accountable Health Communities, which I'll tell you about in a moment. I'd like to tell you about a couple, highlight a few of our programs. Um, this is one of our oldest programs, as you saw. I used to be an ombudsman. I used to run this program. Um, th they serve residents living in nursing homes and assisted living facilities. It's a federally mandated program. It's horribly funded um, under the federal program. Um, we have to do regularly unannounced visits monitor care, resolve problems, investigate complaints, and advocate for change. So I'll give you an example. We had uh, went into a facility, had a complaint about someone not getting uh, showers regularly, wanted to be bathed more regularly, hadn't been bathed in three weeks. We interviewed other people on that same floor and found this was a pattern. We talked to each other and then we found that it was a pattern in this facility and or, or in this corporation, that old multiple facility and we said, what's going on here? And we found out they were having staffing problems all through the corporation. They had not, they were only paying $12 an hour where their competitors in the air were paying um, as much as $13.50 an hour. So they were losing staff. We had to do individual advocacy for that person to get them to have a shower. Then we talked to the corporation about the trends that we saw, not only in that particular facility, but in several of their facilities. Um, and then we um, always have partnerships uh, at the regulatory level with the health department and with Dora. Uh, and then if we need to, we go to Rich and we say, Rich, we need to change something here at the, at, uh, uh, you know, at the legislative level. And we've done that a number of times. Last year, uh, the ombudsman made 300 visits uh, to facility, or 3,000 visits, sorry, to facilities, conducted 60 trainings to staff and to residents. Um, residents often feel like, especially when they move into nursing homes, that they, they will often refer to themselves as inmates. Um, so um, they forget or they don't realize that they have rights basic rights um, and that they are just have to become a part of the system. And we investigated um, over 1,200 uh, complaints. This is the, the nursing homes and assisted living in the region. This is actually an outdated map. We now have 496 facilities in the metropolitan area. Um, you can see they're concentrated, where they're concentrated. When you all are getting requests to have more facilities built in your area um, and you wanna see where the current ones are, please give us a call. We have this map, we keep it updated on a regular basis. Um, just to show you the complexity, uh, Bob Roth actually had me talk to a developer in his area and I said, well, tell me what you're doing. There are 17 facilities exactly what you're talking about in the area that you wanna build. I'm not sure there's a market um, for that and you're not gonna accept Medicaid, so I'm not sure that this is a viable product um, for your community. And um, you know, I gave him my opinion and gave him the statistics and they took it from there. 
Another one of our programs um, is uh, called the Aging and Disability Resource Center. We serve all people 18 and over in this program who are older adults or people with disabilities. We provide information and assistance, options counseling, case management, and the SHIP program. This is that Medicare um, and benefits program. So what's the difference? You might have a call, um, I need help, I can't afford my medications. Uh, uh, okay, so here's what you can do and you understand, you hear the person on the phone and they're going, what, what was that? I don't understand, and what should I say? We know then that that person's probably not going to be likely to follow through, so we send out an options counselor. We go out and the options counselor will meet with the individual and whoever their team of support is, and we will lay out a plan. What do you want to accomplish? You want to get your medications? Are you struggling with other bills that you can't pay? Um, and sometimes when we get out there, we realize there's a whole lot of other things going wrong and that this person's not gonna be able to implement the plan that we set forward with them. And then we have to assign a case manager. Sometimes we can look at benefits. There are um, uh, uh, prescription drug programs that help pay for, for um, prescriptions. We can get costs way down or even free for some individuals. So that's really important. The third program I want to highlight is this program called the Denver Regional or the Accountable Health Communities. This is a big grant that we got from the Centers of Medicaid and Medicare. And the goal of this grant is to bridge clinical and community care, reduce health care costs, improve health outcomes, improve satisfaction of the clients, help people live in their homes longer. It serves all ages. It's focused on Medicaid and Medicare beneficiaries. Um, we currently have eight clinical partners and seven community-based partners. And the, the grant wants us to focus on five areas, nutrition, transportation, housing, energy assistance, and domestic violence. Let me explain this in a different way. We met a man through this program. His name is Dale. He is 79 years old. He has been in the hospital emergency room three times in a year. Um, that triggered uh, the hospital to flag him um, to, to see what was going on. He has diabetes and heart disease and arthritis, so three comorbidities as the health, or as uh, the hospital says. He's married, he has two ch children. That's what the hospital had on him. He shows up in the emergency room, he stays at the hospital, he goes to a cardiac unit, he goes to a step-down unit, he goes to a regular health, uh, or a regular hospital bed for a couple of days, and then they transfer him out. They flagged him because he had been in the hospital or in the emergency room three times, so that's a trigger for our program. We, we go and, and meet him and find out he said he needed transportation, and that's why we're going out. So we talk with Dale, and we find out that, yes, Dale does have a spouse, but she's in the early stages dementia and has quite a bit of health care uh, 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 problems herself. He has one child in New York who's disabled and one child in New Zealand who doesn't get back very often. He needs transportation. Um, he drove when he went in, but now he's not driving. He can't get to his doctor's appointments. He's two weeks behind on getting his meds, so he's been out of meds for two weeks. Um, he doesn't have um, much food. They don't have much food in the refrigerator. Can you see how easy it would be back for Dale to end up back in the hospital again? Just with these simple things. Transportation, nutrition, getting your medicines are not very expensive in the scheme of things. One night stay in a hospital before you count the doc and the blood work and all of that is $9,000. So this is a, a, a very important program that saves healthcare costs, improves his life, he gets to stay home when we wrap services around him to support him in his home and his community. Remember I told you that one of the big drivers of, of our change that forced us to change was this 
growth in the older population, right? This is from 2000 to 2016. Look at the 50 plus population. Look at the 55 and older. That's where the growth is. We hear a lot about millennials, but the fast, the five fast growing cohorts are over 60. Now, we don't start serving people until usually about 75, 80 years old. But look at this, right? All of these people that are 65, 60, and, and, and 65 are going to age, barring some catastrophe, right? We got most of the boomers. The, the peak of the boomer population is 1957. All of these folks. So that's our big target. So we got, they're not quite 65 yet. And we got about 10 years to get our act together in order to serve them well. If we don't, we are going to face the consequences. And we will tell you about the consequences in the near future. 10,000 people a day turn 60 five years old, 10,000 people a day. What does it mean for you in your communities when one in four people are, o are, are over the age of 60? What does it mean when a healthy percentage of those are over 90? Are you planning for those folks? Do you know what you're going to do? So all of these forces that happened over the last 10 years are going to continue, but they pale into co in comparison in what's going to happen in the next 10 years and beyond. This population booms. It gets bigger and more expensive, and there are lots of health care changes being recommended because of this. We're going to talk about that at the board retreat and at next um, at the next meeting, uh, the, uh, the August meeting. This is big stuff. It is not, we can't even talk about the impact of these changes coming our way. So if we want to continue, and I, I'm talking if we want to, right? Because we're the, the cohort that's coming up. Age in our homes and communities, if we want to age better as we live longer, right? Because you can live a long time and have a terrible quality of life. If we want to sustain and improve our health, if we want to increase the quality of life, if we want to lower health care costs and have resources, you all have resources for other local needs, then we must, as an area agency on aging, champion and promote our expertise in home and community-based services. This is our area. We are the experts. We have been doing this since 1974 at Dr. Cog, been the area agency on aging. We are the people that do social determinants of health. We need to increase our resources. We need to do business differently. We need to be more business-minded. Um, we need to develop new funding sources, create new partnerships, understand and respond to the needs, develop new business models. This is really important. And be able to change and adapt quickly um, to opportunities as well as needs that we may be see uh, and, and be prepared and ready. We just have to. The, the stakes are really high, not only for the aging individuals, but for our community as a whole, for our state and for our, for our government. That's why you see so many efforts on how, to, how are we going to lower these skyrocketing health care costs. That's my presentation. She's amazing. Any questions for Jayla? Yes, uh, Director Dell. Ayla, what, what relationship do you have with housing authorities? Uh, how do you interact with them? We work with the housing authority. Housing is a big deal. Affordable housing is a big deal. Um, uh, we, we are excited about a lot of the projects that are in the works, but we're still, the, our biggest challenge right now is um, dealing with those people who need housing today, right? The, in three or four years, it should be better um, because there are a lot of projects coming up, but um, we do work with 
housing authorities. We work with a lot of housing authorities in the area of hoarding. So when somebody is a hoarder and they're about to be evicted, we work really hard to keep them in their homes because there's no other homes. And the other option is like a nursing home because there's not many assisted living that take Medicaid and often these folks are on Medicaid. So they have to go to a higher level of care that they shouldn't even be in. And so I'll follow on that, and I think you addressed it, is that you advocate for some of the residents or service of Olmsman for them. Yep. And if uh, there are, we have constituents and need that help, we should contact you yeah, guys. Right, right. So we work with the Housing Authority. We work with health departments, local and state. Um, right now we have a big problem in, uh, in, in Windsor Gardens. They have a, a bed bug problem, pretty significant bed bug problem. And people don't think that's serious, but if you get bed bugs, you don't get, services won't come into your home. They, you don't get transportation. You don't get your nurse coming in. You don't even get meals on wheels. They leave it on a doorstep. That's just a policy, right? Because um, they're not going to bring your healthcare worker could go in, get it from you, and then take it to multiple other houses. I know you're all creepy, he, Doug. He gets all he gets all itch, itchy when you start talking about bed bugs. <laughs> 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 Any other questions or comments? Yes. You have a, I have a question about, thank you for all of this information. It's really, really important for all of us to be paying attention to it. On the um, slide with the bar graph, it says all ages, 28.6%. I'm not exactly sure what that's referring to. Do you mean all ages? 20? Brad, can you help me? This is a Brad slide. Total growth, right? N and uh, 2016, a 28.6% increase in the overall population, including okay. all ages. So it's all it's it's a population growth is what that correct that okay, for the entire all state. ages. Yep. But then and you it, could see in the older populations that well, it, uh, you see a you know right, it's right. much greater. Yeah, I don't have yeah, my yeah, glasses yeah. No, on. No, no, I get that. I just I wanted to know what the what, if you were given in context or what. So, and then and we also have real numbers that we'll give you at the next presentation. We'll talk. We'll take a much deeper dive into these demographics and what they mean. And the 10,000 people turning 65 uh, a, a day is out of the metro area? It's nationwide. Nation that's a nationwide statistic. Only 10,000 yeah. a day? Well, that's a lot a day. That's 365 <laughs> times 10,000. That's a lot. That's okay. a lot, um, yeah. But I, so then I, my last question is um, the Boober, Boomer Bond uh, survey work that you did back maybe four or five years ago, is that still, still doing going it. Yeah. on? Still going and, on. And is there a report out from that and what the impact has been? Because I think our community would benefit from actually thinking about what impact it had and whether we should continue some things. Brad, do you wanna? This is a, a, a joint effort between aging and planning. For those that are new to the board that, that maybe don't understand the terminology, the Boomer Bond is a program uh, that Dr. Cog works with our member governments to help you and your community prepare for the aging of the population, right? So we ultimately have created an assessment tool uh, with a variety of stakeholders where we um, go in and, and ultimately support a local assessment about how prepared your community is uh, for the aging of the population. And that is from like your human resources tasks and activities um, at the local level all the way through land use, transportation, um, uh, support services, that sort of things. So we've worked in uh, 18 communities around uh, the region. Uh, we actually were just having a conversation with another community uh, today about potentially starting a localized assessment process as well. Um, the primary impact that I would point to is that it really has been something that has ultimately sparked a statewide conversation on these issues, um, including uh, the launch of the Lifelong Colorado uh, initiative that Governor Hickenlooper, Hickenlooper announced back in September of, of last year. Uh, to really, again, big, build a, a cohort, a constituency of local governments around the state that are having conversations about how to become uh, more age-friendly. I'm happy to talk more about the program sort of writ large uh, to the board at some point and or uh, connect you uh, sort of at, at the local level to that opportunity uh, as well. Well, we, we did do one in Englewood, and I'm just wondering if we can see some collective impact, and it might be helpful in the long run to be evaluating and knowing what else we could do. But thank you very much. This is great information. Thank you. Thank you, Director Olson. Director Elrod? <laughs> Better? Better. 
What a great lead in. Thank you, Linda. <laughs> um, so same interest for the city of Littleton because we are currently doing um, both our comprehensive plan as well as a first ever transportation master plan. And it sounds like this is a really great opportunity for us to do that assessment so that we can influence policy making and land use. Yes, good timing? Okay, thank you. Wonderful timing. Makes my heart just flutter and be warm and fuzzy. <laughs> <laughs> Any other uh, thoughts, comments, questions? Seeing none, I just want to say that, Jayla, we appreciate your passion and your focus on our senior population. And I know you do a lot for everybody here in the region, so thank you. Thank you. All right, next up. Next up, item 14, uh, Bike to Work Day, Attachment G in your packet. Uh, Allison Redman. Thank you, Chairman Pfeiffer. And good evening, everyone, and thank you very much for this opportunity to provide a little bit ra of wrap up of our favorite event of the year, and that's Bike to Work Day. My name is Allison Redman, and I have had the absolute pleasure of managing the Way to Go program for the last 78 days now. <laughs> so any questions you have, really. And tonight I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, what Bike to Work Day is for anyone who may not be as familiar, and really why it's so important to our region. Bike to Work Day is an annual free region-wide region -wide event where we encourage people to ditch their vehicles for a day and give bike commuting a whirl. Dr. Cog has been organizing this event for more than 25 years now. Our Way to Go partnership works with community partners around the region, supported by CMAC funding and sponsorship dollars. By Colorado statute, this event takes place every year on the fourth Wednesday in June, so you can go ahead and mark your calendars right now for June 24th, 2020. And the idea behind Bike to Work Day is to provide an introduction to bike commuting in a supportive, safe, and fun environment. The longer term goal is for those people to realize that biking is a great way to commute and to, co to continue this behavior. We're very focused on getting first time bike commuters out there on Bike to Work Day, as they are more likely than repeat participants to continue bike commuting. And our event is the second largest of its kind in the nation. The Bay Area typically sees around 100,000 participants each year, but we like to think that we're closing in on them. <laughs> this year we saw around 31,000 participants. Like I said, we are closing in on them. One of the most exciting numbers to see every year is that first-time participant counts. This year, nearly 40% were first-timers. And as I mentioned before, these are the folks most likely to make a ha habit out of bike commuting. We also love to see that together we collectively saved our region's air from 237 tons of carbon dioxide on bike to work day. And then we collectively ate that many tons of pancakes and I actually did that math. <laughs> and the huge number of calories you see here would have allowed us to eat 533,000 pancakes on bike to work day. Now for those of you, again, not familiar with bike to work day, there are volunteer stations all across the region offering breakfast, including pancakes in the morning, and then water stops and bike parties for the commute home. We also focus on getting support from employers through offering a business challenge on bike to work day. And the businesses with the largest percentages of participating employees get to take home some very cool custom trophies but beyond that, Bike to Work Day is really a great catalyst for getting employers to consider better ways of getting their employees to and from work. It really does open the door for us to have conversations about other efforts like GoTober. So on the right, you can see a map of those stations I mentioned. We had a pretty widespread participation every year. And in fact, this year, if the map was zoomed a little bit out, you'd see stations on I-70 to the west nearly all the way to Glenwood Springs. So it's, it's nearly a statewide uh, event at this point. And on the left is a really great interactive map created by the city and county of Denver where participants could place dots on their origins and destinations. Pretty neat. And here's an example of a station and some kiddos joining in on the fun. And note the lady riding the B-cycle 
over on the right, because we always do like to remind folks who would like to participate to look into the increasing number of rental options around our region, so you don't even necessarily need to have a bicycle. Just a few highlights from 2019. We had some really great sponsors again this year, including CDOT, RTD, DBJ, and KSE. And just to clarify, we also accept sponsors without acronyms. <laughs> and our prizes, as always, were really cool, including concert tickets, wearable Bluetooth speakers, and various biking gear prize packs. And we were really excited to have this year uh, Fatty Bikes, which is a local company, donate an incredible custom fat tire e-bike as the grand, grand prize. And our drawing winner was really over the moon when he won. Um, we also support a Denver Zero Waste Initiative in Civic Center Park by focusing on ways to engage participants without freebies like paper brochures, stickers, and other items that so often end up in the trash or on the ground. As you can see, the event managed an 86% waste diversion rate, meaning that the Civic Center Park Station reduced the amount of waste by 146 pounds as compared to last year's event. We encouraged all the stations around the region to really focus on reducing their waste and we'll strengthen that message again in 2020. I also want to give a shout out to our amazing PR team for getting all the local stations to Civic Center Park at four o'clock in the morning, many of them on bikes. Our event got some really incredible coverage this year. And most importantly, we were able to really promote our larger message, which is that Bike to Work Day is more than just a day. The goal of this event is and always will be long-term change. The Way to Go program is focused on the Metro Vision goals of reducing single occupancy vehicles and vehicle miles traveled in our region. And again, the main reason that we try to get people on their bikes on Bike to Work Day is that first time participants are more likely to keep on riding to work. Bike to Work Day is a great opportunity to remind people that there are actually other ways to get around. And overall, biking is just one of commuting, many commuting options that we promote through the Way to Go program in partnership with our TMOs, including Vanpool, Carpool, Bus, and Train. As you can see from these numbers, the message of Bike to Work Day does seem to be resonating in Denver, throughout our region, and really throughout the entire state of Colorado. Our motto is Bike Today for a Better Tomorrow. Beyond the clear individual and health benefits of bike commuting, registration and participation numbers on Bike to Work Day show the region's support for bike infrastructure improvements and investment. In the current TIP cycle, that's the 2020 to 23 cycle, 30% uh, of the Dr. Cog selected projects are bike ped projects, and many of your communities are doing great things with and without Dr. Cog funding to promote healthier commute choices. In addition, the new Regional Active Transportation Plan envisions a safe, comfortable, and connected network and highlights opportunities and implementa implementation strategies to improve active transportation across the entire region. And of course, best of all, Bike to Work Day is really, really fun. So fun, in fact, that we have several members of our Bike to Work Day team here tonight to just relive the experience with you. <laughs> And, and in closing, thank you to each of your communities and organizations for your support and participation in this really awesome event. We certainly couldn't do it without you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mrs. Redmond. Uh, any questions or comments for her? None? I think she did a great job giving a presentation. <laughs> thank you. Only if Doug can learn from that one. I know, right? I didn't get any applause. But anyway, I, I did want to say, um, listen, I'm going to state the obvious. This takes a tremendous amount of work, and it's it's crazy what they can do with the with the limited staff that they do have. And Allison came in so late in the process. I mean, I can't imagine what she was thinking. Um, but I, it went extremely well. A lot of social media this year. I'm more, It was more intense this year, and I remember it in the past. Um, which is which is fantastic, but it's all about changing behavior, right? Giving people an opportunity, a friendly environment to try it, and hopefully, you know, that resonates, resonates, and um, they'll do it more often. So I think that's the hope, and I think our numbers suggest that it that it, it indeed works. So thank you all very much. Appreciate you. Thank you, Allison. And if anyone hasn't noticed, if we think if there's somebody that represents Dr. Cog, I would have to say it's Todd Cottrell. 
because I don't know how many pictures he was in tonight, but it's kind of like calling, where is Waldo, you know? Think of all the subregions he's at on top of it all. All right, moving right along. We're going to get into the uh, committee reports. Um, let's try to be brief on those so we can get out of here on time because I was really trying to get us out a little early, but I'm not going to make it tonight. Uh, reports from the uh, State Transportation Advisory Committee. Uh, Director Jones. Or Stack. Oh, is it somebody else now? Uh, Director Partridge? Oh, sorry. Hey, Mr. Chair, uh, the last meeting, CDOT presented summary of recent legislative activities impacting transportation funding, and that's what I'm talking about, yes. Of note is the estimated net sum of general fund transfers to CDOT over the next four years of more than $2.5 billion. There's an update and discussion on CDOT's planning reset effort, as uh, Doug think Dur uh, Executive Director Rex referred to this this evening, the 2045 statewide transportation plan. The stack discussed recent and upcoming county level outreach meetings, including counties in the Dr. Cog region. Preliminary results of CDOT's web-based public survey were presented and over 3,000 respondents so far. CDOT also discussed the Multimodal Options Fund Program. They presented the approved funding allocations to the rural TPRs and MPOs. And just to note, Dr. Cog has already reflected its MPO-based Multimodal Options Fund and the new HIP. Hey, Director Partridge. Um, reports from the Metro Mayor Caucus. OK. Direct, or Is it this one? Okay. You got it. Uh, at, at, our last, uh, our, at our last meeting, we focused on the uh, Metro Mayor's Caucus uh, H3 homelessness, uh, housing, and um, uh, some other one, food, you know, what's the food that goes with? Anyway, food resources. And we, um, we have developed, a, uh, refunded with the Metro Mayor's a flex fund uh, with in, a, in a, uh, association with the Denver Foundation and presented a check to um, uh, MMHI, uh, MDHI uh, for uh, short-term assistance in, uh, house, in housing and homelessness uh, services for um, four communities, uh, and they are uh, represented uh, by many of the agencies that the uh, area uh, aging, aging uh, folks work with. And uh, so we're continuing to do that, and then also continuing to work on uh, on transportation. We've had that report. So, thank you, Director Starker. Um, next up is the Metro Area County Commissioners, Director Partridge. We met in May. We met in Adams County, and our discussion was on affordable housing. We had two very good presentations from two jurisdictions. Broomfield Housing Authority and the Adams County Housing Partners, and both of them discussed about the programs that they have and the number of units that they have that are considered affordable and all the work that has continued to be done. Thank you, Director Partridge. Uh, Advisory Committee on Aging, Jayla. The advisory committee know the new Colorado senior law handbooks are in. Um, I know some of you are dealing with issues with family and friends uh, that, that you might benefit from uh, taking one of these. There's a few here. We have 120 boxes of these, so you let me know if anyone in your area needs them. Um, also, the new senior blue book resource um, books are out, one for the north, one for the south area. Uh, it's pretty cool because we got uh, four pages of free advertising on the Area Agency on Aging in these books that t uh, define, uh, a little, tell people more about what we do and the services we provide here at Dr. Cog, again, a resource for your communities or for you, because um, I know some of you are dealing with some tough issues. Thank you, Jayla. Next up, uh, reports from the Regional Air Quality uh, Council, um, uh, Doug Rex. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, if those of you who have been around the board a while, you remember we went through a strategic planning initiative uh, about four years or so ago, and this kind of the purpose was to align our work program with desired outcomes and that with the, for the agency. Well, uh, Regional Air Quality Council is going through a similar exercise, and we've lent out our very own organization 
organizational development director, Jerry Stiegel, who's leading that, that uh, initiative. So he briefed the board, just gave them an overview of the upcoming strategic planning exercise. We also had a discussion about proposed regulations 20 and 21, um, action associated with that, and uh, there be th uh, RAC will be, was claiming party status associated with those two regulations. Uh, we had an overview of the ozone monitoring values. Um, uh, spoiler alert, it ain't good for this year, so, uh, so it is what it is. Um, and last but not least, we got a uh, presentation on the public education campaign for the upcoming ozone season. Well, we're in it, in it now. Simple steps, better air. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Doug. Uh, next up, uh, E-470 Authority, uh, Director Teal. Why, sure. So um, uh, E-470 Authority met on July 11th, uh, last Thursday. Um, really, the meeting started off with uh, um, recognizing the service of our former representative to E-470, Mayor Ronikowski. And um, I think he was surprised all the nice things people said to him, said about him. Um, <laughs> but he was certainly very appreciative. Uh, from there, went right into um, a mid mid-year marketing review. Um, uh, awarded the Colorado State Patrol their contract for services for 2019 through 2024. And then um, uh, engineering and roadway maintenance took over. Uh, town, of, <coughs> town of Parker, uh, it, it, one of the things addressed was an IGA uh, with the Town of Parker's annexation of a portion of land around the roadway. Uh, Rec Arapahoe Park Recreation District Trail, IGA, uh, was approved, which uh, was kind of a fascinating uh, bike extension, uh, bike lane <laughs> extension along E-470. And then, of course, we went through the snow removal and ice control contract um, um, uh, that was approved for the next 10-year period beginning next year in 2020. I had joked that um, uh, since I was uh, appointed as the um, alternate, um, we've had snow every single meeting. And so I made a comment that I thought it was gonna be canceled because there was no snow forecast. That's okay, we talked about snow removal instead. That concludes my report, <laughs> Chairman. Thank you, Director Teal. Next up, reports on Fast Track, to Mr. Van Meter. Thanks. Um, in April, I reported that the RTD board passed a resolution addressing RTD's continuing commitment to complete fast tracks and uh, explore construction and operation of a peak service plan in the Northwest Corridor. Direction to RTD staff was to prepare a supporting report within 60 days. So to that end, on June 14th, RTD released the draft fast tracks initial unfinished corridors report and RTD staff presented that report to the RTD Board of Directors on June 18th. Report has background, a snapshot of the unfinished fast tracks corridors, various funding scenarios, and other funding and finance and revenue options. On July 9th, our board continued discussion on the same topic. Um, staff presented a, a supporting document with questions and from the board and answers, and the board delved into the report in more detail. They're voluminous both the report itself, the supporting appendices and documentation, the question and answers, they are available on the RTD website under the meeting agenda materials for the July 9th RTD board meeting. So I wanted to highlight that because I think it is of interest to this body. Then one non-directly fast tracks related item is light rail ridership, just that's the other kind of highlight right now at that same meeting on July 9th, our board um, delved into the reports, was um, in the Denver Post on Saturday, um, regarding ridership specifically on light rail. So just to set a couple numbers in context, light rail ridership in the first five months of this year compared to the same period last year is down 13.7% at RTD. Total ridership is down 1.8% in that same period. Ridership on the flat tire and flyer, our bus services and commuter rail is all up. So on basically all the rest of our services, ridership is up. On light rail, it's down 13.7%. That's very 
concerning to staff and of course to the board of directors. So um, no concrete understanding of why. We continue to try to research and understand the topic. We looked at things such as enrollment at the Auraria campus, which is well served by light rail and not as well served by the other modes, frankly, no change there, and as a big ridership generator for RTD, no change there. Um, we looked to see if average trip length of our patrons and trips had changed over that time period. Perhaps scooters and bicycles were stealing um, riders from RTD, no appreciable change in trip length. So it's not that, we can't point to that. Um, one thing that we have noted is that in our customer satisfaction surveys, two items that our customers highly value in our services are one on-time performance, not a surprise, and the other is the value paid for, value paid for the fare or the value received for the fare paid. And customer ratings for light rail of those two measures have dropped between 2017 and 2019. Again, concerning to us, and we're looking at that more detail. There was some speculation that maybe it had to do with our fare changes that were implemented in January of this year, but why then would ridership on commuter rail, the Flatiron Flyer, and all of our bus services not represent or see the same impact. Um, so we've looked at a number of other items, but just wanted to report that to you since it was front page news and give you some of those insights. That concludes my report. Thank you, Mr. Van Meter. All right, uh, before we uh, get close to comments and adjournment, uh, I have homework assignment for two communities, Sheridan and North Glen. It will be the highlights for the community next month. So if you can uh, task your staff to put something together for you, that'd be yeah. great. So we'll see you next month. Uh, any other matters by the members? Seeing none, we're adjourned. <laughs>